The first presenter will be Adam Roberts Whitman today, which is in his last year of PhD from the Laboratory of Environmental and Urban Economics, with a presentation titled Visual Capital and Scale Assessment of Building Level Visual Landscape Quality. Is that one? Yes. Okay. Cool. Should I use this? Uh, use the... Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, uh, first off, thanks, thanks to the Doc Days. This is actually pretty cool. Uh, as I, as they said, I'm a fourth year uh, PhD in the Economics Lab. And over the next 10 minutes, uh, hopefully we'll try to highlight uh, my motivation for my PhD research, which is really focused on how to integrate spatial modeling methods within uh, property valuation. And that will lead uh, ultimately to the visual capital, which is a paper I have currently under uh, revision. So uh, this is generally the field of urban analytics. Uh, urban analytics uses computational and statistical methods to study the built environment. So anywhere from the heat, uh, heat island effect to vegetation, urban sprawl, and even something as abstract as visual quality. And central to all of these methods is the, the input data on the left-hand side, you see. Uh, and most studies in this field primarily use uh, high-resolution imagery, uh, especially in, in visual analysis, and uh, satellite street view imagery being the most common, I'm, I'm sure you've seen. Um, but as you look a little bit closer into the literature, I think there's a, a fairly big opportunity for 3D CAD data, Jazz Architects I'm sure you're familiar with. And the biggest differentiator for CAD models is the mutability. Uh, mutability refers to just to be able to alter the images, so Im uh, alter the, the models themselves. So unlike images, which is uh, a bit more difficult. And next, and this is really specific to Switzerland, is that Switzerland's invested an incredible amount of money and time into uh, building up its GIS infrastructure. And so, you know, in places like the US where I'm from, you really only have New York City and everywhere else is, you have to use open street maps, it's sparse data. But in Switzerland, you have a 3D CAD model for pretty much for every uh, building. So it's really neat. But of course, the biggest weakness to using uh, 3D CAD data is, uh, is the fidelity. Fidelity refers to how real, uh, how real of a representation it is. So images, you can see every every single detail, uh, but CAD, it's typically just a, a big a big block. But as you, if you consider that a lot of the machine learning approaches, what they end up doing is actually uh, compressing the images, and you lose a lot of the images, a lot of the information embedded within high fidelity. So in the end, how much information do you actually lose versus how much do you, how much can you gain from being able to alter the, the data in the first place? And so if we look at a classic urban analytics pipeline, you start off with some design parameters on the left, and that'll allow you to generate some 3D design of the environment of a building. And then you can use that design to simulate uh, all sorts of environmental situations. So daylight, noise, structural, and even the, the view, which I'm talking about today. And then finally, you can record these simulations to see uh, how well it actually performs. And the greatest advantage, of course, to, to 3D is this mutability. So you can start to perturb the design parameters and see how much the how much of it one unit change there is in the performance attribute. And this is really a cause effect uh, setup that's quite common: mechanical engineering, structural engineering, finite element analysis. And what it gets at is risk and vulnerability assessment. And so, what I'm interested in specifically is to what degree can we translate this to some financial implications? So, perturbing the design, what's the financial implication of one additional unit of visual quality, daylight, so forth. And one of the most interesting case studies um, is really the view to deploy this kind of approach. On one hand, because the view uh, is a luxury good, meaning that you're, you will be increasingly paying for a better quality view. And at the same time, it's a public, public good, meaning that uh, uh, because of its spatial nature, the views are shared by you and your neighbors. And so really to help illustrate this, this, the latest Twitter controversy is a skyscraper posed in San Francisco. Uh, so as you, one second look at it, you can see it's completely out of character. 
But at the same time, you have to acknowledge that the views from the top are probably quite dramatic. And that would suggest the eventual buyer, if this actually goes through, uh, is going to pay a premium for that. But that premium, of course, is at the cost of its neighbors. Its neighbor's view is now obstructed. And this is really a classic environmental problem of private gain, public loss. So really, the question becomes, how, to, how can we quantify this trade-off? And of course, with 3D, you can start to simulate your environment and start measuring. So in the case of this little difficulty work set, it's just adding additional floors and how does that uh, change? So for each additional floor, we want to quantify the direct effect of an additional floor on that point of modification and the spatially lagged effect of additional floors onto its neighbors and uh, neighbors of the point of modification. And really what's critical to this approach is that we need a metric that can benchmark the view for us. So the view from one story and a view of a 10 story and that of its neighbors. Um, and this metric, uh, of course, as the name suggests, is what I, what I propose visual capital. And so this is really the first part of my PhD was centered around developing evaluation metrics and pricing models to study environmental, uh, environmental influence. And typically, these approaches use housing transaction data, and you try to infer the willingness to pay for it using the hedonic pricing model. But when it comes to the view specifically, the view is far more complex than the number of real estate transactions that we have. And so what happens is that we're statistically underpowered to create a generalized measure of the view, uh, which is why a lot of studies that attempt to value the view are all located in a single city, like just New York, or smaller case studies are simplifying the view to just line of sight, some sort of Boolean. And this is all in a matter to reduce the complexity relative to the number of transactions that they have, so they can reach some sort of statistical answer. Um, and so to solve for this, instead of using housing prices, I tried to model the income sorting effect, which is the little graph here on the right. And this income sorting effect is effectively the phenomenon where high income individuals move to locations of higher quality amenities. So in essence, I'm using, I'm assuming that there are better views in locations of higher incomes. And so this is really the, the model setup that my paper goes into and the approach to evaluate the view. And in the end, I introduce a building level measure of visual landscape, which I'll get to in a bit. But now that we have some sort of metric that can quantify this, we can set up a case study where we come back to our 3D, uh, 3D simulation of the environment and start to ask questions about the financial impact that a proposed design, proposed urban plan, uh, either by individual developers or by, uh, by the community, the, the designs that they have. So how, how financially vulnerable are the buildings in San Supi, where you can imagine that the value of the, the, value of the home is highly tied to the view it has. Um, and so how vulnerable, how at risk are these uh, buildings? And of course, you can expand this to other scenarios. So what, what happens if we start adding trees, removing streets, which could be perceived as a negative, uh, negative influence on? Uh, what if you even, in a hypothetical case, drain the lake? These sort of uh, cost-benefit analysis. And really taking this one step further, where I'm going with this is, as my title suggested, is that we can look at this as an additional dimension of design evaluation. And so most generative design or uh, design automation techniques, they focus on two primary objectives. You want to minimize the cost to deliver a project. So using less materials, uh, higher quality materials, and you want to maximize the physical performance. So maximize the, the magnitude of earthquake a building can withstand or, or some example like that. And through what, what I've discussed today, we're effectively proposing uh, or introducing two additional dimensions by which we can evaluate a design. And this is like the appraisal part where we can start to minimize the social cost imposed on others and your neighbors and maximize the individual value uh, of your specific lot. And so just in the final minute without getting too much detail, I'll quickly go over the methodology. Uh, I have a bunch of slides afterwards if you're, if you're interested in going more specifics. But in a nutshell, we start off with 2D land cover uh, and 3D cadaster data. This is all open data. Uh, uh, substantial work goes, goes into, into generating this, uh, this viewpoint data set, which is basically a view shed or visit visibility analysis from points on each facade for all buildings in Switzerland. 
Now these viewpoints, as this little schematic shows, 120 degree cone, looking out and see what, what are the land covers that you see from each point. And you could kind of imagine that each facade point looking out is basically an image, kind of like the one that's, that's down there. And so the first step is to, now you have a buildings of all sorts of sizes. So that means they have a varying number of window views. So you have to then aggregate to one factor, one building level. And this is what we do. We create a, a whole bunch of building metrics. So the, the maximum share of the lake, maximum share of, of, uh, of nature, so on and so forth. And things that get more complex, like the positive elements of positive sensitivity, negative uh, complexity, balance, things like that. And then finally, we use this to model income sorting, which is when we combine the common level income, uh, finally producing the uh, visual capital, which is a calibrated measure from derived from income. And this ultimately represents the preference for a building's portfolio of viewpoints. And so with that, I'm, you know, I'm done. Uh, thanks for your time and uh, looking forward to any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam. So we'll keep the... Yeah. The floor to the respondents. Yeah. Let's just remember you have a, a 20 minutes of discussion, and so we can uh, discuss it. It's open to the public as well to make questions and to comment and to share your thoughts. <laughs> thanks. Um, thanks a lot, Adam, for the presentation, the research. Very, very um interesting things uh, i don't typically think about in so, so much detail i would just like you to um explain a little bit more your the way that you measure it how did you call it the visual capital you try to squeeze it into one minute yeah. there but it's really hard to follow sure. these you know what is the number um how do you calculate it how do you evaluate it and do you have any way of um verifying whether the assumptions that you make uh, that some building has a higher visual capital actually overlap with the reality and you talked about fidelity and so on yeah yeah just a few more details. okay um so i can try to quickly go over um so this is the the, the data that i used this is sort of an explanation of what the view shed, uh, the view shed is so for each point we have an um statistics on what is actually seen from that uh, from that observation point, and it could be represented by an image, but this is actually just tabular data. And then this is one viewpoint portfolio, so this is one building, and this is just an abstract of how the whole data set looks like. So it's just the whole data set of viewpoints. Do you qualitatively assign values to what's being seen? So what's or? being seen is this uh, this land cover data. So I have yeah. 18 different metrics. So this is okay. a combination of the Copernicus. So this is all EU land cover, yeah. the agriculture zoning in Switzerland, and the main one being the Swiss TLM, which is um, a full categorization of uh, essentially a land cover map. And what we then do with this, we have a hierarchy of maybe like 200, I would say, maybe 150, 200 different land cover types. So then we have to organize them by what's most influential, which is really by how scarce the item is. And so in the end, you get this sort of land cover map. And when we have the 3D, you can imagine these the ray tracing approach being shot out, and whatever it lands on is the value that's subscribed. But from each point of view, we're launching like 2,600 rays. So every time a point lands, it's a, a fractional percentage. So for each ray that comes out, this, you have 100 points, basically, 100 percentages. And then so the root, the, the, the number of points that come in here is shown as a percentage. So a view might have uh, 20, uh, 20 is high, but 5 percent view of the lake. That means looking out the window, you have 5 percent of the visual visual potential is, is five. And so this is really the, the essence of the model here. So we start with this visual share data set. So like I said, there's 33 million view observations, 288 visual share features. So these are all the, the, the land cover characteristics. 18 landscape categories, four obstruction categories. So we're being obstructed by facades, roofs, and vegetation. Um, and the vegetation data set is from uh, the research center in the, the Alps, I forget the name, and the four distances. And so these are the aggregation functions. 
and so we could produce these really cool maps of what um, what you can see where from the country. And so these are all individual buildings. Um, and so really the essence of your question was coming down to how we're actually training them up. So the way I'm doing it is if you go, if you remember the income sorting effect, it's the idea that I can say that the view or uh, higher income individuals are choosing locations with better views. So this is the essence of the assumption. But I can only make that assumption if there's true competition happening. Mm -hmm. So you can have you can go to some place in the Alps, uh, for instance, where there isn't much competition. That means higher individuals or even uh, low income individuals could live in areas that have nice views. Mm -hmm. So I can't that assumption wouldn't hold there. We would only assume in a place where there's actual competition. That means if I want a high quality view, my money is only going to get me as uh, or my money is the restriction on my preference or uh, my income is. And so what I do is segment it by the top 10 agglomerations, which I'm assuming are the, the regions of competition. And so now this brings me down to a million buildings or, or something along that nature. And I'm restricting it to uh, five stories and below. Uh, in essence, because there aren't many tall buildings. So I include the one tall building in Basel. It, it skews my, my data set. And then what we do is um, a gradient boosted regression tree, which is, the, is it's just a nonlinear model by which individual elements can start interacting. And so I don't have the slide here, but in the paper I go over a lot of the times in these pricing models, you assume linear independence. So the, 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 the effect that the lake has is independent of the view of the mountains. Mm -hmm. And so by using these nonlinear methods, I can say that there's an additional effect of having a lake view and a mountain. Dis uh, that's separate from the, the, uh, the sum of mm -hmm. the view of a lake and view of a mountain. Mm -hmm. And now, to, to answer your question on how to validate this, and then finally, we run this, we get the, the thing. So here are some of my things from my paper. And the validation is really, so I can ask, start answering, uh, asking a bunch of questions related to how is it, and I'll just do this little section here. Um, how, how is the visual capital actually distributed? So the, what kind of questions I could ask, which elements are scarce and abundant? So I know that the lake is scarce, that matches, and the sky is highly abundant. I have a whole range. Which elements are most important to the prediction of visual capital? It gives you uh, uh, an understanding of what's most uh, what's most influential, and that what the water, water, and things in the distance. And I have another plot showing the interaction of those two that I suggested. And how does visual capital correlate with the urban and natural form? And so there's really two hot spots that emerge. I could talk about that if you would like. Um, and then we can start talking about the spatial distribution. How is the view actually? Uh, distributed across the region, and are the, how how is visual capital, uh, or are there uh, regions of inequity? Meaning, is it concentrated only in uh, high income neighborhoods, or does it actually spill over? And then finally, to your question, what are the regions of high visual capital? And this really is where I can validate it. I can I subset. Uh, I look at just Lausanne, and I do a. Um, uh, I look for the regions of statistically significant um, that are st regions of statistically high uh, visual capital. Um, and so I'm able to now draw boundaries of all these buildings that have high visual capital. And so unsurprisingly, they appear in regions of high income because this is of course my model. But what happens now is that you get this spillover, spillover effect because it doesn't adhere to just administration boundaries. It adheres to what the buildings can actually see. So I'm spilling past administration boundaries and identifying that these buildings, even in this low-income neighborhood, so Puyi, I think, was 115,000 uh, average income, and Lausanne was around 75, 79. But, it, but it's able to spill over and identify these pockets. And what's interesting is I left out a few high-income neighborhoods from my data set, these little label, red-labeled ones, and it's able to identify these. And the strongest one is... Um, I'm not going to say it right as an American, but this little Kami Jodia Mexti, this is a high income neighborhood. It's able to identify, even though there's no high income neighborhood around it. So there's no influence of spatial spillover, but it's able to, to catch it. Um, and so that's kind of the. Yeah. Validation. No, thanks a lot for all the details. It's a super fascinating. I wish we had like an hour so you could explain it all in detail to me. Um, but Jordan, I, I don't want to take up all the time. The only thing I, I want to maybe um, 
give you, uh, I mean, it, it becomes very obvious you're very thorough about the quantification of the um, information that you want to work with, which is what my first question into that, but I'm glad to see there's a lot going on there. Um, I guess what's really interesting at a point you talk about then generative design and how to use this within design is that I think we can all agree that not everything can be quantified. Mm -hmm. So there's a question of how do you then deal with, um, yeah, just questions and values that are not quantifiable mm -hmm. at the point where, I mean, you, you have the data, you have the, the, the numbers, yeah. Which I think is a really good base to work with. It's more like, what do you then do with that? While being aware that not everything can be quantified yeah, to so the level. The, that the, the like. question then becomes do we know what we can quantify? Yeah. Um, so we want to explore as much as possible to be able to quantify as much as possible. And then once we have an idea of what we can't quantify, is it enough that we can now build a model that predicts the average? And then the everything else can be considered noise, and that's the distribution around your prediction. Is it sufficient, or is there or is there a significant bias by which you can then just, if you are able to identify it, maybe you start correcting for it or find correlates. So, it's I don't see it's it's not a problem we can't address in this quantitative setting. Um, but yeah, of, of course. Um, and the so this the paper really gets into diving deep into the idea of visual capital, and then kind of the. The next idea is to start running sensitivity analysis mm -hmm. to how sensitive one building is to another. And this is ultimately um, will be then fed into a pricing model to see how impacted it is. Uh, yeah. And that gets at the design, design automation. I mean, that's then yet again the next question was you, you quickly addressed that is mm -hmm. what is the actual goal then uh, of having this model, being able to predict the capital, et cetera? What are you actually? want to do with it. So you said you're trying to minimize the impact on yep. uh, the, you call it social or uh, like the social cost. Yeah, the social cost. Um, but then maximize the value. They're clearly in opposition one with the other. So how do you balance that and where what's really uh, how can you use this model say to the advantage of of, of who actually so so there are, there are um, so there's a post generally in design, design automation where you have a specific plot and you start, start simulating all the, the different geometries that can occur in an effort to try to maximize yeah. these objectives. And so, yeah. so typically, what's done is you're looking at, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the physical cost. Uh, so maybe the, uh, so maybe the kind of construction, the construction if it's an advanced approach, approach. You're, you're considering fabrication methods where you're considering. considering Sunlight lines, things like, like, like this, like respective, respective to the individual lot. But what's, but what's missing, missing is, is the, the actual valuation, valuation of the property. property. And so, in order so to do that, you have to, have to quantify these environmental, environmental attributes, attributes independent, independent of this, of this approach, approach, similar, similar to, this, to this, and see, and see how much are people willing to pay for home buyers willing to, willing to how, how much do they prefer it and, and then you embed that back, back, back within the design, design, design explorer, explorer and you have a form finding, finding where, where the valuation is informing the same way that the cost or the same way that anything else is informing your design evolution. Yeah, yeah. Okay, last quick comment. <laughs> no, but, uh, just Right now, you're assuming that the generative design approach, the automating the design yeah. generation is something that's functional and uh, we all have it running and it's the right way to go. I would leave this as an open question because there's been a lot of exploration in that area, but mm -hmm. the results are not necessarily um, consensual that sure we can just automate design. There's so many factors to it. Well, no, no, no. Um, so that's a, I'm not sure if yeah, question. <laughs> Um, but and then you would add, you know, your parameters and your perspective into that. I think it's. But it also, it also is to consider, consider, consider what are you. It's not a technical. What's the design that you're, that you're it's not a technical limitation whether we can automate design or not. <laughs> it's more a question of uh, do we want to and what factors can we quantify and can we not? Well, yeah. Where is the human input in that process? How much do you give out or not? And that's a more of a paradigm discussion, which I think is a fair discussion. Well, it's, it's still a question, question because then it matters. matters. You're you're not, not, you might not necessarily be the one physically designing it, but you're still designing these evaluation functions, which is effectively what this is. So the more you start 
influencing what you're evaluating and what should be evaluated. Yeah. A developer might have a completely set of evaluation metrics. A developer probably might not care much about it, about a whole bunch of stuff, but the community does. And so now if they have tools to quickly evaluate it, the same tools that are available to developers, now there's going to be a conflict of what is an optimal design. And so there still is room for, there. it's not like no algorithm will reach like a single source of truth, but it's ultimately your that's preferences. The and that's the idea of the preferences, right? Your, your preference is what's driving this form of exploration. Yeah, it's a very specific approach to design that you're kind of assuming as a given. And I, I just saying to keep that as an yeah, of course. open discussion. Somebody take yeah. this away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll serve it to respondents to last well, just on this. Uh, um, you know, basically, yeah, you're starting yeah. from the assumption. You have to use the microphone. Yeah, you like to use it? Okay, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think here, basically, you're starting from the assumption that there is inequality, right? So the visual capital is an equally distributed. Yes. Uh, so it's one of you know, following more or less on, you know, one, maybe the overarching objective is maybe to reduce inequality in the city, I mean, which is not just visual, but you know, there are other issues related to inequality. So is that a possible outcome of what you're doing? And the other question, which is somehow related to this, uh, I understand that you have to link uh, you know, everything to income because you have the data in a sense, but how would you define quality, the visual quality, you know, if you had access to any other type of information? So what is visual quality in the end, basically? Uh, because you have basically just income in a sense, right? Yeah, so yeah. if I have money, I'm in a nice place, but is that it? Or are you missing uh, something else which is important to, to define the quality of a landscape or of, of, of the view? So the, the limitation? It's kind of. Oh. Sorry, I'm just going to collect all the questions first. Oh, yeah. Because we have only five minutes. Okay. So then we do the yeah, discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's not. Yes. Yes, it is. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Is it? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I wonder to what extent you also take into account the interaction with other buildings at the level of materiality, technical performance, because you might have a very wonderful view to a Gary building, yeah? But that the same building could, um, let's say with time, uh, cause some problems and we're all familiar with the glare problem, especially in Gary's case, but also many other controversies of glare. So the view might be wonderful, but the materiality, technical performance mm -hmm. surface in a, a, well, when predicted this performance in a certain period of time, could fire back. And then the visual appearance kind of the view, what you call view, might not be that positively valued. So, and of course, this will require to fully assess what the view, it's kind of connected to the previous question, to fully assess what the quality of the view is. We also have to take into account some, some social factors, so some previous cases of, let's say, controversies related to player buildings or controversies related to that type of materiality, mm -hmm. depending on what kind of uh, interaction with neighboring, neighboring buildings are uh, there yeah. in a specific urban context. Of course, this is only kind of connected to urban context and not that much to the uh, kind of natural aspect and the view as related to natural resources and everything that you have shown. So to what extent the social factor could be also kind of present and part of your model and also the temporal changes of how view and the visual capital could also factor these changes in, a, let's say, in, a, in a 10 or 20 years and, and whether this could be kind of the, the, the potential individual change it. Yeah, we still have time. Yep. Okay. So um I'll, I'll first I'll first address the, the limitations. Those are um uh exactly like you said. So the limitation of course comes back to this idea of fidelity where I'm using the, the images that I'm, or the data, input data that I'm using is restricted to just these 288 features. And in that, there, the reason I use, sorry to keep jumping around, but the reason I use this, because this is effectively the resolution, uh, resolution of the like fidelity measure that I'm dealing with. So I have no idea of the, the material components that, you know, this one might be some pink color that I find hideous or that this is actually a really nice stone. I have no, this, to me, it doesn't It doesn't matter if this, or it's not being considered. So same thing with Galera, I don't have windows. This is all stuff that I have actually my master's student 
is helping me pull the windows, but we we don't have this level of detail doesn't exist yet. But as the GIS infrastructure continues to grow, this is something that's that's being addressed. Um, so the, the, the limitations, the, the next step would be ideally, best case scenario would be if Google has uh, Earth, you can start maneuvering around, but there's no no free way to come in and actually access, you know, I'm on this point. This is effectively what we're doing here, right? Because uh, the Swiss, Swiss ge uh, geodata is all free. We can select whatever point we're at and whatever orientation and elevation. With Google, you can't do that. And so if we had access to that, then maybe we'd have a much better picture or holistic understanding. Maybe we could start capturing these material aspects or the glare. You could start asking more interesting questions there. Um, but again, this also comes to the limitation is as you start increasing the complexity of the, these images, we need more and more complex uh, target data. And the target data that I'm using now is these communes. Uh, so I'm assigning all the buildings in a commune the same uh, income. And so uh, moving forward, if we had individual housing prices or individual incomes, that would be, of course, the, the way to go. If I may just, uh, yeah, yeah. just to pop in, uh, what I was wondering, you know, beyond the limitations of what you're doing, you know, yeah. how do we want do you define the climate of the landscape? Then that's what it was. So is there any evidence that oh, how would I in the medical sciences? So what is the ah. nice view? Is something that I feel calm when mm -hmm. I look at it? Or, uh, uh, you know, I guess there are studies, right? So, yes, yes. Medical. So there's one of the, the most interesting studies is um, they hooked up people to MRIs or, or some, some machine and showed a bunch of images. And so what they were able to find is that natural elements, so high fractals, nature, the response you have you actually process the image much faster. And when you have a man-made, so streets, parking, um, traffic lights, things like this, um, then it takes your brain a little bit longer to process. And this increased processing is actually what causes stress. And there's a ton of studies that I'm sure you're familiar with is that having uh, better landscapes are, are more calming, um, yeah, more calming or you feel more at peace, things like this. And so there's a lot of, Evidence showing the, the benefits of uh, like the health implications of nicer views. And this, of course, is, there's other papers showing that offices that have nice overlooking video uh, views of nature are actually willing to pay uh, an increased amount. So, so is it mostly nature in the end, the highest nature. quality? Nature. Okay. You know, you know, I'm wondering if I'm, for uh, example, in Paris, right? Even if I'm looking at the Polyphene, right? It yeah. can be a better view than, uh, than looking at the, at the forest. Yeah. So, no, that, that's why I'm wondering. So it's just nature making the, the beauty or the, so this, the this quality actually, of the landscape or, or, or what you are doing? Right, right, right. Right. Great question. So this, in the end, it comes back down to just the complexity of view and what we're actually able to predict are completely imbalanced. So the, the, we always have to simplify the view so much so that it basically comes down to man-made nature. And this is kind of what the literature draws. So we need more and more complex methods to try to draw out the information. Um, what I've been playing around with, what you're kind of getting at is seeing like a landmark. The landmarks, of course, are, are a big thing. But the reason the landmark is, uh, is perceived because there's this short social benefit ascribed to it, but it all comes down to scarcity. And scarcity is, of course, what we innately ascribe value to. And so I started looking, relating housing prices along um, Lake Geneva versus Lake Zurich to see how many nice high quality views per uh, per unit comparing it to the price. And when you ultimately find, what I found is that Geneva, the, the reason or the trade-off is you can suppress the amount of buildings that there are through zoning or something and increase the value of the property, or you have a, a truly nice view where you're still overbuilt. And so it, it creates this dichotomy of, is the price being suppressed because it's overbuilt or is it being suppressed because, or is it being inflated because it's just, you could start seeing the directional forces, uh, the market forces versus like zoning aspect of, of, of not being able to, to build up. So, I don't know if that answers your question. So, thank you so much, um, Adam, for your presentation. Thanks again. Um, I would love to ask for, for the public if you have some questions, but we are just running on the time. And I will, I will invite you to join uh, Adam in our apero after and the, the coffee break to ask you whatever you want to him. Okay. And then uh, we pass for the next presentation. <laughs>